Hello everyone, welcome to Decode in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo, and on today's show, we have an extremely special guest, Decred Project Lead, Jake Yokumpai. Jake, how you doing? I'm doing well, Angelo. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing great. So this week, Decred announced its privacy feature, and it's exciting times for the project. So this show is going to be specifically focused on privacy. For the first question, Jake, I'll start with, is privacy dead? I think privacy, uh, it's very easy to make a broad statement like privacy being dead. And I think that it's important to, you know, deconstruct this statement and really talk about dead. Uh, privacy has a context. You, you know, everything is private from something else. That is that, you know, like, like you and the person in the, in the same room as you, you might be having a private conversation and it's private because the context is other people aren't in the room, you know, maybe who shouldn't be. So I feel like privacy, you could argue that privacy is dead because technologically, say, somebody could be using a satellite and recording all of this audio that, you know, that, that we're having in a quote unquote private conversation straight through a building. So if that's possible, then that is one way to argue it. That is that privacy is dead. But I feel like it's all context dependent. It's a, you know, how far are you willing to go to have a private conversation or be private? And who are you trying to keep things private from? So I would argue that privacy is not dead, but privacy for the average human being is becoming a scarcer and scarcer commodity as a function of time because people are making this trade off to go, I don't care what it takes, you know, as long as it's convenient. Um, I'm willing to give up all of my privacy for, you know, uh, like a steady stream of things to buy or whatever. I mean, so I feel like for the average person, you could argue that privacy is, is it's, it's on the decline big time. So now um, with surveillance capitalism in play in today's online world, why is privacy important and what can people do to protect it? I think surveillance capitalism is a, you know, I view it as a massive problem. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people in Silicon Valley who would beg to differ with me because they've made vast amounts of money from, uh, you know, implementation of surveillance capitalism through various avenues. Um, surveillance capitalism is just this big idea that um, you can monetize people's behavior and the way you monetize that behavior is by surveilling them. So for example, if you, you know you have an application and it takes over a microphone or a video camera or you know logs your, logs your keystrokes, that information can be mined to extract information about your behavior, which can then be sold to someone else. And I feel like it's becoming a, a it's it's a very common strategy to uh, you know to take in the current world we live in because people don't think about uh, the consequences of having that information that behavioral data extracted and sold to someone else which is you know large tech companies will say oh no the information is you know it's anonymized or it's uh, or it's hidden and I feel that you know surveillance capitalism is really uh, it, it's it, it's not on the surface, and that's it's opaque. I really don't like that, and I feel like that process is a very negative process where you give so you lied, you're effectively lying to someone. Where you you bait and switch them. You go, hey, here's this free service, but the service isn't really free. You use it, and then someone spies on you while you use it, and then they sell that behavioral data to someone else. And uh, it's it's a very strange world because both intelligence services and marketers are very keen to have this information. So. It's a double-edged sword, and you know I feel like it's almost uh, by design. And then in terms of you know how privacy adds value, or you know you know why you would want privacy is is privacy really it adds a lot of value. As soon as somebody knows what you're doing, when you're doing, and how you're doing it, they can then take uh you know they can take steps to get ahead of you and go aha I know say Angelo is going to be walking to this place at this time to buy this to buy this item I'm a, I'm going to go be there because I know where he's going in advance of him going there. So this behavioral data allows people's patterns to be predicted and extracted in a way that's very beneficial to people who want to either control you or your buying habits. Now, how do you feel they could protect this or is there a way to protect it? Uh, protecting against, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the theft of information, you know, the theft of your behavioral patterns is, it takes, a, it takes an unusually large amount of work. Most of the online infrastructure that you know that the average person uses on a day to day basis is um, you know it's deeply embedded into the surveillance capitalist society. Almost every one of the major you know major tech companies now is uh, you know surveilling almost everything you do while you're on their platform and also surveilling you while you're not on their platform and 
what you can do is you can avoid these platforms. I personally, you know, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm the guy who's been avoiding Google for over 10 years uh, and avoiding, uh, I don't run JavaScript from other, you know, from most websites on my computer because you just don't know what the, you know, what it's doing on your, you know, on your machine. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do sort of on, uh, you know, like don't, don't install an Alexa, you know, an Amazon Alexa in your house. Don't install a Nest, uh, you know, a Nest appliance in your house. Now, just like I was saying earlier, it's this massive trade-off between convenience and, um, you know, convenience and privacy. And most people are just, they're not interested in um, thinking about this very much. So they believe what they're told by these major, you know, major publicly traded corporations to get the convenience that they think they need or want. And, you know, all the while their, you know, their, their behavioral data is being, you know, extracted 10 ways from Sunday from all of these appliances and services that they use. And so if you really want privacy in, for, you know, for, as a, as a normal person, you've got to, you've got to work for it. You've got to avoid these, uh, these uh, information collection oracles or service oracles that uh, use, that use uh, your behavior as an opportunity to monetize a, a service. So why do you feel people should care about it? Is there a danger outside of the behavioral tracking that you feel people should be aware of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I touched on it with the the example I gave before. Like, let's say somebody knows that you are going to location X at time Y, you know, you know, for purpose Z. That's an incredibly powerful thing that most people don't think about. You know, on a day to day basis, if you're some random person and you're going to the you know the corner store to buy a snack or whatever. Th- most people don't care, but let's pretend for for a moment that you're I don't know you hold some political views that someone finds threatening, or you uh, you know, or you have a message that people consider to be uh, what is it non PC like I don't know Alex Jones. I, and disclaimer, I'm not a huge Alex Jones fan by any means, but uh, I you know I oh, just kind of see the guy for the sake of the example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for the sake of the example, the guy's a lightning rod for controversy, right? So he's been he's been deplatformed from all these various platforms, and. People like that, if uh, you know, surveillance capitalism can act as a as a tracking tool for these people. You don't even need to you know pin a you know pin a satellite on somebody and you know surveil them twenty four seven three sixty five. If they if they implicitly opt in to all of these uh, behavioral tracking uh, routines, and then let's say somebody wants to uh, you know catch you in a dark alley at the wrong time of day in the wrong place. Well, if they know where you're going, when you're going, and why you're going there, they can most certainly do that. Whether you know whether we're talking about somebody who's going to arrest you for committing a quote unquote crime, and I say quote unquote because it really varies by jurisdiction, or you know somebody who wants to just beat the crap out of you because they don't share your political beliefs. Um, th- you know, this is why I feel like people should really care about privacy is because, uh, in, pr- in particular, surveillance capitalism because it allows people to get ahead of you. So if people know what you're going to do before you do it. They can outmaneuver you and change your behavior, or uh, you know, basically coerce you to think or act differently than you would otherwise. So, how do you feel that protecting your privacy can limit power? Well, protecting your so protecting your privacy means that people don't have this same power to trivially track and outmaneuver you. So, it, you know, if, if if you know if I have some you know uh, kooky beliefs and somebody you know somebody goes I don't know somebody at Facebook or Google goes I don't like those beliefs I'm going to censor them and then also I'm going to you know I'm going to tell I don't know the local police that Jake's walking down this alley at this time and then they're going to go beat his ass up the ability to withhold this <laughs> you know this this behavioral data acts as a means to counter the uh, you know the spying. And then also the the uh, the outmaneuvering that I've referred to. So if people don't know what you're doing, it's hard for them to outmaneuver you. So it's sort of like a, 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 you know, a, a game theory comes up a lot in the context of cryptocurrencies, and I feel like it's it's very much present here, which is the the information war that that uh, you know humans are fighting on planet Earth right now is really all about this, and uh, that's why privacy matters because if someone knows what you're going to do before you do it, they can manipulate you in so many ways. Understood. Now we've seen in the cryptocurrency space, um, the importance of privacy. So why did you feel that it was important for Decred to implement this technology? I feel like in, you know, in the particular context of, uh, you know, of cryptocurrencies and Decred specifically, sovereignty matters. The, the real revolution with 
cryptocurrency began with Bitcoin by someone, you know, by Satoshi Nakamoto, the group, uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, noting that, listen, we can collectively make some really impressive tools if we work together to, you know, to, uh, you know, to uh, create a system where, where decisions are made collectively as a group. Now, if someone who's an adversary to this kind of a system knows where, you know, how these decisions are going to be made, where they're made, who is making them in advance, that's a big threat to the system because they can, you know, these people and these actors within the system can be manipulated. And specifically in the context of Decred, what, we, what we've done, obviously, right, is there's the timestamps, that's Bitcoin and proof of work. What we've done is we've gamified decision making. And so you can, you can understand and appreciate that if you can get to the decision makers, you can compromise their ability to make good decisions. And this is, this is you know, a huge issue in nation state politics, right? Um, like especially with this recent uh, Jeffrey Epstein stuff. If, you know, if the intent of Jeffrey Epstein's op operation, for example, was to, uh, you know, get pictures or video of people in compromising situations, that directly compromises their ability to make independent decisions. You know, like you're going to make some decision and somebody shows up with a video and goes, hey, remember this time that I recorded you and you were doing this thing that if this video got out, your life would be ruined? Yeah, you're going to make the decision the way I'm telling you to make it. And so privacy, whether it's, you know, in terms of people videotaping you or, uh, you know, or in terms of knowing who is making the decisions is incredibly important in a sovereignty system. So because we've gamified decision making and our decisions matter a lot in Decred, you know, whether it's the treasury or, uh, you know, proposals or consensus changes, being able to control the people who make these decisions is a huge deal. And uh, privacy is a tool to, that, you know, in particular, the way we've integrated it, it protects the sovereignty of the people making these decisions in a way that uh, other systems in the cryptocurrency space do not. So now what's the underlying technology behind Decred's new privacy feature? And are the transactions truly private? So the way it works is, you know, is this, is that the, the observation I made a long time ago was, I really like what, say, Monero and Zcash have done, but they, you know, they have a pruning problem. When you make it, when you make it impossible to tell or d to, to determine where funds came from, uh, it, it becomes impossible to sort of throw away old transactions as a function of time. I wanted to preserve that, and that's kind of what led us to the system we have. So the system that, that, uh, you know, that we've revealed is based on CoinShuffle++, which was a system originally proposed for Bitcoin mixing. And... It was proposed by uh, Ruffin, uh, Moreno Sanchez, and, and Kate, and I think it was back in, I want to say, summer of uh, 2016 was when the work was done. And so what it is, is that it's a system for creating coin join transactions that, where the, the payouts from those transactions are anonymized or mixed such that uh, not only can the participants not determine where, where, where the funds went, Anything acting as a bulletin board or server for this process cannot determine where the outputs went, and this is what really drew me to it. And, and you know, if you look at the way it's the way it's built, is it's very very simple. There's not that many components to it. It only uses straightforward normal cryptography, albeit used in a bit of a, a bit more creative way than usual. And um, it was also something that that stood out to me as an opportunity to overlay this over the uh, ticketing system that we use for our governance. So that, for example, if you can mix these transactions, and in order for them to be mixed when they come out, they all have to be the same size. Our tickets are at least you know sort of uh, what I want to say uh, time locally the same size. You know, the ticket price changes every twelve hours. That fits very nicely with the simplicity of the system. So it's a simple system. It, and then we have a creative way to, to wire it up and, and get volume into it. And then the other component that, that really stood out to me as, as why we should pursue it is that it's adaptable. Because, you know, say ring signatures or zero-knowledge proofs, um, those things have to go on chain. And as a, function of, uh, as a function of going on chain, that very much constrains you in terms of like, hey, I've got a new version or I've got a new change or, oh, my God, we have to change the protocol because somebody broke it. it Implementing consensus changes is real tough in cryptocurrencies, and we didn't want to pin a. We wanted to do. We wanted to make the system flexible so that, like, let's say we need to change it, it's not like a three month process to make a consensus change or some sort of crazy emergency process to make a consensus change. 
So, so, so that's sort of what drove us to choose that solution. And then in terms of privacy, what you end up getting out of these coin join transactions is you get anonymity within an epoch. There's a timer that runs every, uh, on mainnet, it's 20 minutes. And people subscribe over that 20 minute period. Like let's say 10 of us show up and go, hey, I wanna mix, hey, I wanna mix. So 10 people are, are participating. Then the mix process starts at the end of the timer. And then, and then through that process, any um, mis misbehaving peers get punted from the mix. Then at the end of it, uh, you're left with a coin join transaction that gets published on the, you know, on the network that has these outputs that nobody, including the server, can track. And so that's, and, and that's the kind of privacy you get. You get N anonymity within an epoch. So if there's 10 of us participating, you would have 10 anonymity within the epoch of that mixing. And uh, just to compare it is is it's actually very similar to how ring signatures work, except ring signatures are an on chain you know on chain blob where they're one of one of uh, it, at least currently there's ten mix ins so there's eleven sets of UTXOs or or, or of transaction outputs that, that that are potentially the inputs, but only one of those eleven sets is you know is, is the real deal. So say with Monero, Monero does this on chain and they get. 11 anonymity within a transaction, whereas what Decred's doing gives you N anonymity within an epoch, where N is the number of other mixed participants you have. Hmm. So you said it works together with a ticketing system. Do uh, you want to go into detail on, on how that exactly works? How are we using the tickets that are in the pool to make these uh, coin join transactions? Sure thing. Um, what I'll do is, is, is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the existing, uh, you know, vol transaction volume that flows through our, you know, our ticketing system. You know, at, at a ticket price of roughly 100, and, you know, 128 or 130 decredit ticket, the, the total amount of coins flowing through this system every day is about 180 some odd thousand coins. And um, in terms of, you know, the, the current total outstanding amount of decred, that's roughly 1.8% of the, you know, 10 million coins in circulation that is rotating through the system every 24 hours. So it acts as a very natural, you know, high, you know, high volume, ch you know, churn that is a great way to, you know, to get into, uh, or, or excuse me, to sort of create a strong mix net. So it, if you run the numbers backwards from that, you go, okay, let's 50% of the stakers are solo, 50% are with stake pools. And, and you know, my estimate is about 50% of the solo stakers will opt into this, and we'll get into that in more detail in just a little bit. But the way it ends up working is, is that when you purchase tickets, there is a process called, uh, you know, where, where the wallet creates these things called split transactions, where the idea is, is you want to create a single input that gets fully consumed when you create a ticket. So it's basically an, uh, like an output for the amount of, of the ticket plus a fee. Then the, fee, then the ticket consumes that entire UTXO and, uh, you know, and then bang, you have a ticket. What, what we ended up doing is, is that these split transactions already existed as, uh, you know, as just sort of part of our infrastructure. So it was natural to incorporate the creation of these, uh, you know, of these split transactions with the mixing process. So to go, as you're creating these specially sized UTXOs that then get consumed by tickets, you just run that process in a, you know, in a, uh, in a mix. So there's a denomination that's equal to the ticket plus a fee. And then um, everyone sort of opts in and, you know, puts their inputs in, creates a coin join transaction, and then bang, the outputs, which are these, uh, you know, split, sp split transaction outputs are entirely anonymized. So that then, when those tickets vote, um, the the subsidy or you know the commit the subsidy that comes out of the comes to the commitment address, basically the reward for the ticket, that output is uh, fully anonymized. At which point, you know you can uh, you can basically put it right back in the uh, you know the the mixed account you would have in your wallet uh, that that, that uh, keeps track of the mixed uh, UTXOs that you control. Understood. Now on the first. Uh blog that you wrote, you compared all the projects. Where do you feel Decred's privacy feature falls in between all the privacy projects that are available to users now? I tried to communicate this uh, positionally with the, uh, you know, with, the, with the chart that I had put out, which is that um, the original chart was, it was Monero, Zcash, Mimblewimble, Bitcoin, and uh, Dash. 
And I feel like I've ranked those in terms of the quality of their privacy. Now, I figured there's a little bit of a disclaimer about Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't really have any built-in privacy, but the Zero-Link protocol that, you know, that goes along with, with Wasabi Wallet is pretty good. And so I figured that that would be the most appropriate thing to consider as privacy for Bitcoin. And um, I feel like what we do is that, is that with this system in place, we're doing better than both Bitcoin and, um, uh, and Dash, but... Uh, we still have a ways to go to, you know, catch up with, say, Mimblewimble, Zero, uh, Zcash, and with Monero. And the reasoning there is, is that what we've what we've managed to get out of this uh, coin this coin shuffle process uh, is that we uh, we've broken the link between inputs and outputs of these mixed transactions. That is that anyone who has an, who controls an output of one of these mixed transactions has plausible deniability regarding who is in control uh, or you know which one of the inputs it came from. So that breaks the normally deterministic link between like if say I send funds from you know me to you know or some 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 funds I control from me to you Angela. In that case, it's deterministic. You can see that you know set of coins A went to address B and that is 100% you can't argue with it. However, the coin join process and the process we use for the you know you know for coin, uh, for for coin shuffle plus plus which is referred to as dice mix light. Uh, it's a variation on dice mix which is in the paper. That breaks that link and um, that that only gets you part of the way to the privacy that is offered by say Mimblewimble and Zcash and Monero. In the case of all three of those, they all uh, obfuscate transaction amounts, which we don't yet do. And uh, th the reason we didn't do that is because that is a consensus change. And and uh, you can't exactly work on consensus changes in secret with, uh, with Decred, because in order for us to make these consensus changes, as you're aware, there's this three-month process where things have to get proposed on Politea. Then uh, once they're proposed on Politea, they get implemented in software. Then they go up for a consensus vote. Then it gets voted on, and then it gets activated. So there's this whole, you know, there's a whole process to that. So the reason we, we decided to focus on CoinShuffle++ was it didn't require any consensus changes. So, so it, it, and it accomplished what I consider to be the most important uh, element here, which is breaking the deterministic link between inputs of transactions and outputs of transactions. So now I've seen around Twitter, um, some people have made some comments about that, stating that, I mean, I guess just questioning our governance because it was not put to vote, but it just sounds a bit short-sighted because this has been in discussion for a long time. And it, adds value to the project. So why wouldn't we want to add it? You know, it just, it just makes me think of that. Uh, so now you mentioned Dash. I know that it has a private send feature, but from my understanding, it's not truly private. Uh, the master nodes can expose the transactions. What protective measures did the developers take in protecting the DCR implementation from bad actors and people wanting to expose the new tech for weakness? So, um, I, I mean, if, uh, and what, what were you saying about the people? What were people on Twitter saying? They were talking about why why there wasn't a consensus change. Uh, ah, okay. So, um, you know, in terms of it not being a consensus change, it just works out that that the way that uh, Coin Shuffle Plus Plus works is is that we can we can basically take what other people and I was sort of touching on this earlier. You can take the the ring signature plausible deniability uh, you know tech from Monero, and what we've done is effectively push that off chain. Now there's some definite there's definitely some downsides to doing that, but one of the major upsides is just that you don't need to change the the consensus rules, and that's why we focused on that. And then also, you know, why we weren't public about it is that this is a pretty creative solution to this problem. A lot of people would you know sort of uh, will just go, hey, let's encrypt the blockchain, wave your hands, and do whatever it takes to make it encrypted. And it's you know there's consequences to doing that, like breaking pruning or you know drastically changing the structure of a transaction, which is what Mimblewimble does. So people, uh, you know, something I've noticed about Decred is, is that there's no shortage of people who will complain about even even the best work that you're doing. So, uh, so I don't really take it to heart when people get upset about things like this. So let's circle back to, to Dash and private send. So Dash, um, Dash has obviously been around, uh, you know, like a full two, two years longer than Decred. Um, they were the first ones to, uh, to have uh, on-chain governance for, you know, for real. I, I was incredibly irritated when they released it in the summer of 2015 because I was working on exactly that kind of a system. So I was incredibly frustrated to see, to, you know, to see that. They, I, I definitely got scooped by Dash early on. But 
Um, what ended up happening with private send is this, is that, so right, Dash used to be Xcoin. Xcoin became Darkcoin. And I think at the point they rebranded from Xcoin to Darkcoin, they created Dark Send. And then it became Dark Send Plus. And then that became, once they rebranded to Dash, that became Private Send. And the way it works is this, is that they do a distributed coin join and the, and they do a distributed coin join using the um, their master node network. So instead of people buying tickets on a regular basis like they do in Decred, what they do in Dash is, is that if you lock a thousand, um, you basically create a special transaction where you lock a thousand Dash, then you get a, uh, you get like a special key to make a, it, it, it's, uh, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly how the transactions look, but you lock a thousand dash to create, to create a master node and it has a corresponding pub key and you then use that to run a net, uh, a master node. And then as you participate in the, uh, you know, in the mixing, but the mixing process is one of the things that you do. And then I believe you also, uh, you know, participate in the, uh, chain validation process and then you re- you obtain a reward so it's like our ticketing system but it's static like boom there's a master node and there's i think several i think there's several thousand master nodes um i i don't know off the top of my head yeah i think that's right like five thousand ish of these things so master nodes the way this works is is that then um if you use private send let's say i want to private send you a hundred dash what i would do is that i would specify a number of rounds in their you know in their in their gui click, 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 and then it would uh, fire this through with a certain number of uh, rounds of coin joins, and then the funds would end up with you. So that what it would do is it would conceal the sender, me, from the receiver, you. And then uh, similarly, you could do the same kind of thing if you wanted to send it along to you know the next person in the chain, say Bob or Carol or whatever. And uh, what it does is it does a coin join on a series of pseudo-randomly chosen master nodes uh, according to the number of rounds that you want to that you want to do. Now this this works fine, but when you do a vanilla coin join that is not one that's say using Coin Shuffle plus plus or as uh, say uh, Zero Link uses on Bitcoin, uh, Chow Me and Coin Join, the server can trivially see both the source and the destination of all of the coins. Now, as I'm sure you can understand, that's a little bit of a drag, but you'd yeah, I mean the idea here is that each 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 master node where this happens can see this going on, and then that ends up uh, you know opening it up for attack in the sense that let's pretend there's a, a fraction of the master nodes who are colluding against you, or let's pretend for a moment that a huge swath of the master nodes are controlled by a single person or a small group, which uh, they most certainly are not. I just wanted to reinforce that here. Um, in that in that in those scenarios your your privacy is greatly diminished because whoever controls these these master nodes is capable of de-anonymizing the coin joins that that are performed on their nodes so that's sort of the shortcoming of you know of dash is that the system is pretty is pretty uh, I, I you know i think it's pretty smart that they distribute it across the nodes in their network but um, you know in, in it has a very serious weakness, which is just if enough of these master nodes participate, you know, collude, they can strip you of your privacy. So the way we've sort of engineered against that with, you know, with using Coin Shuffle Plus Plus is really the Coin Shuffle process uses this sort of inner protocol called Dice Mix. And Dice Mix is a variation on, um, you know, it's, it's it's sort of like a you know a, a new and improved version of the Dining Cryptographers Network, which is used for people to publish information anonymously. Um, so dice mix you, it builds on that and creates a system where you can't tell where the outputs are going, even if you're the, even if you're the server bulletin board and even if you're one of the peers. So that is a very that's a very strong property. So as much as you know, there's there's an effort with Dash to distribute the coin join process across a number of machines, a number of master nodes. In our in our case, we don't need to do that to guarantee privacy. The privacy is guaranteed by the mathematical construction of the dice mix process. So even if, even if someone's running a single centralized server, which is the configuration that we have off the blocks, the most they can see is where funds are coming from, but they can't see where funds are going. And that's by design. So, so in that, you know, in that vein, I, you know, my argument is, is that, you know, the dash system is weaker than this because it is possible to effectively undo, undo or de-anonymize mixes in the dash, in the dash network. So what you know, just as a disclaimer and a you know expectation management is we when we released this we released this because uh, it was at a point where it needs it needs eyes on it it needs people to use it and it, it needs it needs exposure. So 
rather than say integrate it all the way into our you know our, our GUI wallet Decrediton um, off the blocks, what we did is we we've released a version that's command line only and um, is built to work in two scenarios: one, if you are a solo staker, and two, if you uh, if you are mixing regular transactions. So you need to use CLI, and you need to either be a solo staker or you need to be a uh, someone who's mixing normal transactions, like you're not participating in the staking network. And in terms of using this, so, so those are constraints about using it. In terms of how to use this, um, the way it breaks down is, is that you do this by creating multiple accounts. We have BIP32-ish you know, BIP uh, uh, supported wallets. I say that because we're not quite strictly BIP32, if I recall correctly. Um, so we have a bunch of these uh, hierarchical deterministic uh, accounts and in order to use privacy, uh, you know, as a as a uh, solo staker, you're going to need to create a few accounts on on your uh, on your machine. You're going to need to have a voting account, which is typically you'd import from an external voting wallet. You're going to have an unmixed account, which would be a local account, and you're going to have a mixed account, which would be a local account. So, in in the mixed and unmixed would also be present in the non-staking configuration that I'm referring to here. So, the way this would work is. As you're mixing these funds, like let's say you, with, you withdraw a thousand decred from an exchange and you go, I want to participate in this privacy system. What you would do is you would, uh, you would take the funds and deposit them into your, and withdraw them to your unmixed account. And then, um, and then what you would do is maybe you, move, you might actually move them to a default account. And then you would set the mixer going where the purchase account is set to, uh, you know, is set to the default. Then the outputs go into the mixed account, and then the unmixed account is for change. Change is very tricky in this system, and uh, you have to be very careful with it. So we actually the, the handling of this is effectively automated. Like let's say I send you uh, I send you hundred decred, Angelo. You would receive that into your unmixed account. Then you would you would have that that unmixed amount downmixed into mixed chunks which then end up in your mixed account. So th this process takes like, I don't know, like an hour, maybe a two, maybe two hours tops right now. And then when you spend funds and send them to someone else, you would spend from your mixed account, but uh, in the future, any, anytime you want something to be private, you would receive the funds into your unmixed account. Now, as you can see here, because, in, because accounts are involved, this is kind of a, it, you know, it's a non-trivial user, inter uh, what is it, uh, user interface. And this is also why we decided to go command line only initially is because there's details in here that we're going to have to really smooth out in order to make this a decent user experience on a, you know, on a graphical wallet. So, so from a, from a management perspective, that's, you know, that's part of it. Now, what that gets you is that gets you roughly blockchain privacy in the sense that somebody can't tell who is sending um, the funds that, that have been sent um, or who is buying the tickets. But, if you're doing things like voting on Politea or you are in the, buy, in the process of buying tickets, it, it would be ideal to use Tor or, uh, you know, or, or connect to a hidden service because what this would do is this would then further disconnect your identity from, say, you know, your public IP that you're using for these, uh, you know, for these kinds of communications. So, so the, process of, uh, the process of using privacy definitely comes with some caveats. Um, and, and we're still in the process of smoothing out these, you know, the rough edges of, you know, of how the, uh, of how the technology works. Understood. So taken away from what you just said, so can you send from two mixed accounts to each other or do you have to send it to their default account once the coins have been mixed? I think that, uh, so the way it works is, is that if you want to conceal from your sender where your funds are going, you need to receive it into an unmixed or default account, which is then mixed into the mixed account. And, uh, you know, so, so for example, it's definitely possible to, you know, have poor OPSEC and screw up and be like, you know, give someone a mixed account address versus an unmixed account address, which is also why, you know, like I said, the, the edges, the edges are rough, but the system definitely works. Um, it, it requires a fair amount of, uh, you know, it requires a fair amount of care with, uh, in, in using it right now. But uh, in the future, we're going to, you know, we're going to try to make it more idiot proof so that, uh, so that it's a lot more difficult to shoot yourself in the foot like that. Like, for example, receiving funds into a mixed account as opposed to an unmixed account. Understood. So now what are those steps? What are some of the things that are 
that you're looking forward to in the future when it comes to the, to DCR's privacy implementation? So the, a couple of the uh, a couple of the changes that were well, actually I think there's three changes that that we're planning to make that are relatively large. So one of them, and I'm gonna I'm gonna name them in terms of how low hanging the fruit are, how low how low hanging the fruit is. Um, in the first change that we you know that we want to make is is we want to integrate this into Decrediton for people who want to mix regular transactions. And I say regular transactions because when you're using Decrediton. You, it doesn't allow you to solo stake. So you have to use a, uh, you know, a voting service provider, a VSP. And if you're using a VSP, then there's other privacy problems, which I'll get into in just a second. So we would, we would add support for mixing normal transactions on there. And we would make it a series of, say, like check boxes to be like um, on your receive page, it would by default show you your unmixed account. And then there'd be a check box or you know, something to show you this is you're receiving into a private account. Just to remind the user, hey, hey, this isn't just a normal account and the configuration is just so. Similarly, when you're sending, we would probably restrict your ability to send from your unmixed account and basically make it, you know, effectively force you to send from your mixed account. So that way you don't make, you know, sort of the OPSEC slip ups that could lead to, you know, your, your privacy being damaged. So that's, uh, that's, uh, st- that's sort of uh, step one in terms of, uh, making the system smoother and getting it deployed more widely. Step two is the voting service provider uh, situation. As I noted before, about 50% of the, of all of the tickets are stored in, in VSPs or, or staked um, such that VSPs can vote them. And that process is very not anonymous. When you, when you have, everyone has an account with a VSP. So the VSP can see which tickets they control Different VSPs have different fees. The fees are baked into the tickets. So the, the, the fee on a ticket, even if you had everything else an- anonymized, uh, allows people to partition the anonymity set and go like, hey, you're one of 10 users who uses pool X. Um, so we need, to, we need to get rid of accounts. We need, to get rid of, uh, we need to get rid of fees in the tickets directly. And we need to get rid of, what's the last thing? Uh, oh, man, it's hard to keep track of all this sometime. Um, the other thing, the other thing we need to get rid of is we need to get rid of. Uh, oh yeah, the the um, the voting address. So the way the voting address works with uh, VSPs is that it's a one of two multi sig, and it's a it's a it's a script. So it's a, a PUSH uh, transact. You know uh, what is it? Output that gets paid to. So the reason we have one of two is so that either you or the pool can vote. What we're going to have to do is we're going to have to flip the situation where when you set up that one of two address, you supply a pub key, and then the uh, what is it? The uh, VSP replies with the one of two multi-sig, which you then need to store. What we would do is we would change it so that when you buy it, when you buy a ticket, you would set the voting address as uh, you know whatever address, and then you would go to the VSP and push a private key just for that uh, just for that voting address to it, and then they would import it. And what that would do is that would mean that every ticket would have a different address, and then on top of having a different address you would also need to get rid of this idea of accounts. So for example, instead of, instead of people being able to set their voting preferences across all their tickets with one knob, you would have to communicate with the voting service provider one ticket at a time and set the, the, the voting preferences for each ticket separately. And then the last change would be that you have to, you have to pay out of band for the VSP service. That is that you would have to pay presumably up front, um, either on-chain or off-chain, possibly over LN, you would pay to have them, uh, you know, uh, watch and, and vote for that ticket. So that process. So basically, everything that, about how VSPs work currently would need to be changed. And so that's a lot of that's a lot of work. It's hard to say when that would be done. So that's several months out. Um, and then the last change would be um, replacing the the centralized server. So we have a central we have a central uh, you know server that that operates all this stuff and acts like a meeting a meeting point and a bulletin board. For uh, for these mixes, and that is obviously you know there there's some vulnerability there, which is the single point of failure. We've discussed either making the configuration high availability so multiple people could run servers, or potentially making it a uh, you know a uh, mempool like process. So you know there's a mempool for transactions. We would create what is roughly a mixing mempool where where the the coin shuffle coin shuffle plus plus process would occur in a mempool that's special before the transactions are created and then pushed into the normal mempool. 
So that's a, you know, so that's sort of the third big, you know, big thing that would need to be changed to sort of get the system more widely deployed. So once those three things are done, I'm going to guess, I would estimate that 50% of the stakeholders would opt into the system. And just for perspective, that would mean that our anonymity set for the whole process is about 25% of the state, uh, 25% of the issuance, uh, because 50% of the coins are staked. So something like, you know, 2.5 million decred and, you know, the, what, who knows where our market cap is right now? It's like, I don't know, 200, let's say 240 million, something like $60 million pool of, uh, of anonymous uh, tickets. That's uh, sort of the rough scale uh, at which uh, this would be operating. So how about CT transactions? And um, I actually, apart from the consensus part, why was ring signatures, um, bulletproofs and zero knowledge proofs avoided? Well, right. So uh, the, the the issue with ring signatures. Okay, so we, we'll talk about ring signatures first, and then I'll get on to the other ones. Ring signatures in Monero currently use ten mixins, and the way this works is, is that if you have inputs to a transaction, you collect those. There might be n inputs. Then you then you pick ten mixins, which is ten sets of the same number of inputs, ran, you know, semi randomly chosen. And you take all those things together and you make a ring signature over them. And what that tells you is that tells you one of these 11 sets of, of UTXOs is, uh, is valid. And anyone who's watching the chain can't tell which one of those 11 is the, you know, is the actual set of UTXOs. And what, is it, what that means is that means that let's pretend 100 years in the future, 50 years in the future, I can't go back and throw away old Monero transactions because I don't know whether it's spent or not, right? So when you do, when you can't tell uh, uh, whether things are spent, you can't throw away old historical transactions. And I, I, I to me, that's a big problem from the perspective of uh, scalability and sustainability. It creates issues uh, because I mean, even Monero, they, they been they bent the meaning of the word pruning uh, recently. I, there was even a little bit of interaction on social media with them about it. And to them, pruning is throwing away some information associated with the blockchain. But the you know the real sort of uh, you know commonly commonly accepted meaning of pruning is uh, discarding old transactions from the blockchain, spent transactions in particular. And because you can't tell what's spent Monero, their pruning is, is, is it's a clever way of sharding their database, uh, you know, of all the historical transactions. So each node only stores an eighth and it reduces the footprint of the, uh, it reduces the footprint of, uh, operating a full node, but it's not really throwing away any history. It's just distributing the history. And, um, Z Zcash is actually in the same kind of situation because Zcash has even more plausible deniability when it comes to exactly which transactions were the inputs. Um, that is that the inputs to, to a Zcash, a shielded Zcash transaction are totally opaque. So it could literally be any of the, any of the, you know, shielded subset of their UTXO set, um, could be, uh, you know, could be, uh, the input there. So they have the same problem, which is that at least on their shielded, uh, subset of transactions, they can't throw away any of the transactions because they don't know which ones are spent and which ones aren't. And, um, you know, Mimblewimble doesn't have this problem because, uh, they've actually got, uh, you know, they don't, they don't use obfuscation the same way that, uh, that say Monero and Zcash do. In their case, they use, they use, uh, in a way, Mimblewimble is doing on-chain what we're doing off-chain. That is, they merge all their all their transactions together, and for them, that's a block. And for us, that's a that's a coin shuffle plus plus transaction. So, um, and, and and remind me exactly. Uh, oh, and and you were saying that the future of a uh, CT of bulletproof. Oh, in the future in, of CTs. in, in okay. DCR. Yeah, and so where we where we went with this is that you know uh, confidential transactions is great. Monero added it after the fact. And I think that, you know, right now we're, you know, we're, we're getting toward, uh, there's some overlap between the original Monero based on the CryptoNote V1, pro, uh, V1 protocol and what we're doing here with, uh, with Decred. But once you add confidential, confidential transactions, you can, add, you can obfuscate the amounts. Now, adding confidential transactions is a messy business because if somebody has a quantum computer that, you know, operates at scale, they can uh, silently forge um, they can silently uh, mint coins, which is obviously very, very bad. It's you know it'd be bad for that to happen in Monero or Mimblewimble because both of them use CT. But 
it would be really bad in Decred because our sovereignty system is based on coins. So if you can forge coins, you can just take over and wreck our system beyond the whole inflation angle. Um, so adding confidential transactions is, is tricky business because we need to be careful, more careful about how we add it than, say, you know, Monero or Mimblewimble uh, you know, has been. And the reason we would want to add this beyond the fact that obfuscating amounts is cool is that the way uh, CoinShuffle++ plus plus works is that there is, um, you know, there is a ticket denomination that changes every so often, but then there's a bunch of fixed denominations that you have to mix down through um, for, for change. So there's like eight, denom eight or nine denominations that we're using currently with CoinShuffle++. Plus plus. And what that does is that takes the um, set of transactions being mixed and it, and it breaks it up, right? So it breaks it up into these nine groups based on denomination. If you add uh, confidential transaction support, you can mix them all together because no one can see the amounts. Further, you don't have to break change into a whole bunch of little chunks um, because no one, no one can uh, link the change to the original inputs. That's actually the reason that you have to uh, that you have to mix everything down when you're using CoinShuffle plus plus is that it's it's possible to infer which inputs are linked to which uh, change, and then if you include the change, say with like a mixed output, then you can infer that the mixed output links to the inputs that link to that change. So, confidential transactions allows you to break that link that uh, you know uh, you know that weakness and get away from the fact that you are stuck with uh, with mixing all of this change. So it could be that adding CT actually leads to a, a transaction storage savings um, in terms of uh, on-chain footprint relative to how we're doing it currently. So adding adding confidential transactions is tricky, and um, but it solves a lot of problems for us. It drastically simplifies the, the denomination handling, and it uh, increases the quality of each one of the mixes, and then it uh, means you don't need to break things down into so many pieces. The, now, the minus is, is that, let's say we implemented confidential transactions the way that, that say, Monero and Mimblewimble did, which is that they, they did it using Peterson commitments, and then they use range proofs, and in their case, they did, um, uh, what was it? Originally, Monero did the, the basic uh, range proofs suggested by, uh, by Greg Maxwell in his, in his original write-up, and those were very big. And then they converted to bulletproofs later, which were, it's a much more optimized procedure that's uh, actually derived from these generic, uh, what is it, zero knowledge proof uh, literature. That is that there's a, the way bulletproofs operate is that there's a specific um, form of the zero knowledge proof that, that then can be, uh, you know, formulated in a way that it isn't a generic, uh, you know, basically you can special case it and it drastically simplifies, uh, you know, say the, the uh, library you'd have to write to do it. So uh, that's great. But what then ends up happening is, is that it's a perfectly hiding scheme, uh, you know, the, the bulletproofs as proposed. And that, and it's perfectly hiding, but computationally binding. What that means is, if you if somebody rocks up with a quantum computer, they can forge coins by screwing with the, uh, you know, by screwing with the commitments and all of that. But they can't, uh, they can't see the amounts. They can, basically they they can't unblind they they can't unblind the amounts. But what they can do is they can go, well, okay, it used to be uh, four plus six uh, equals ten, and now it's going to be uh, what is it? 27 minus, uh, what is it? 27 minus 17 equals 10. And you can start really monkeying with the, uh, you know, how much, uh, you know, where the funds are coming from, where they're going to, and you can forge, you can effectively forge coins. Now for, for, like I said, for Decred, that's obviously, that's a showstopper. To, I think there's really no way we can run that ball, but there are comments that indicate that it's possible to, to invert that scheme, you know, in terms of its properties, that is instead make it computationally, uh, computationally hiding and perfectly binding. And what that means is bi perfectly binding means you can't, you can't forge the commitments, but it is possible for people to, uh, you know, with a quantum computer to, to basically unblind the amount. So I don't, you know, I can't speak for everybody and this is going to have to be assessed via proposal and you know, all of that. But I, Hey, if somebody shows up with a quantum computer and you can unblind the amounts, congratulations. But uh, you know, as long as you're not going to be able to wreck and sort of deep six our whole project. That to me is really, you know, that's what matters a whole lot more. And then in the future, we can we can transition to something that's post quantum secure and you know doesn't have these uh, same these same weaknesses. Now, how about scaling and the speed to which these coins are shuffled? Do you see uh, do you see a time coming where we can implement it with 
with Lightning that should be released soon? So in terms of, uh, in terms of Lightning and scaling is the, the time scale that these things are mixed on. The epoch we have for mainnet is currently set at 20 minutes. And the reason we did that is, let's say, uh, you know, just the math behind it is if one quarter of the tickets end up using this system, then that's roughly 1.25 tickets per, uh, per block that would need to be bought. You go, okay, 20 minutes is four blocks at five minutes. That's 1.25 tickets on average times five, times four blocks. That's five tickets. So on a, we did that on it because we figured that listen, we need a longer epoch in order to get a decent uh, a decent mix quality for the tickets. So th- th- I would expect there to be uh, roughly five tickets every 20 minutes in this system once it really gets up and going. You know, go, going full spi- full speed. I would expect that to happen sometime in the next uh, in the next you know three months and. From a scalability perspective, I think most people who are sending private transactions, particularly if you're sending bigger transactions, waiting, I don't know, between like 20 minutes and an hour to get, uh, you know, to get your funds mixed really isn't such a big deal. Um, you know, it's still way faster than a bank, and uh, you know, it, I, I'm, it seems to work fine for these other privacy coins out there, even the ones that have slower block times. But when it comes to instantaneous, like, like, uh, what is it? Low latency payments. Like, let's say you're at a point of sale and you want to buy something and have it be private. You really need the Lightning Network for something like that. Um, it's con- I mean, e- let's take Monero. Even Monero with their one, I think it's all. I think they have one minute block time. Even with a one minute block time, somebody who's trying to use Monero at a point of sale still has to wait. You know, you, you need to be able in order to have an efficient point of sale uh, experience. The you know things need to settle within tens of seconds or less. I mean, and I, I think even a minute is, a, is, is longer than most people would care to wait. So, um, and, you know, beyond the fact that then it's on chain, then it's taking up space in the blockchain and, you know, all of that, and that part of the scaling. Um, Lightning Network is really the way forward for that. And we do have a big release coming up. Uh, Mateus uh, De Giovanni, um, he is, he's our, light, he's our uh, LND, DCR LND lead. He's been doing an enormous amount of work over the past several months. And he's uh, he's done some really amazing stuff recently. I don't want to get into it and really scoop him. I just want to I just want to I just want to say he's done some really amazing work recently with with LN. But um, with respect to privacy, you know, my my understanding of privacy in the context of LN is that it's substantially more complex than it is with uh, you know, say on chain on chain uh, on chain uh, transactions are. One way of looking at it is like a it's like a broadcast radio network. Everybody broadcasts. Everybody can li- you know tune into that frequency and listen to your signals. So encrypting your radio is is relatively straightforward. But then when you start going well, what does privacy mean when you get off chain? Um, off chain communications are routed uh, communications. That is that you know there's these channels um, and just like say we're communicating right now over the wired internet, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, you know basically. Uh, electromagnetic communication channels that are that are bounded and isolated and though those things send the signals back and forth privacy in a routed network is a lot different than it is in a broadcast network so in a in a routed network you not only need to worry about uh you know you need to worry about path privacy you need to worry about uh what payload privacy there's a lot of there's a lot of extra things to consider here so um, Coin Shuffle Plus Plus might have some utility in the context of, of off-chain privacy, but I suspect that for off-chain privacy, we're going to have to explore other, you know, other avenues when it comes to, uh, you know, when it comes to techniques. I've read a few papers about this, and it, you know, the techniques change pretty substantially, and it seems like a lot of the privacy is is based on um, what is it? Uh, chan- uh, what is it? Uh, balance privacy, because right, you have all these channels, like say between me and you. Let's say there's three three of these uh, nodes. The way it works right now with Lightning Network is you can you query these intermediate nodes to determine a routing path, and then they, so their balances are transparently queryable. As a function of that, um, that means not great privacy if you're sending and receiving on that network. If I can trivially see like what your balance is, then so can everybody else. So balance privacy is one big facet of uh, you know of off chain privacy. And then there's also things like path privacy. I mean, there's a, there's a lot to it. And the existing Lightning Network infrastructure needs to be modified 
pretty decently in order to, to deliver that. So we'll get on to that, but uh, we're, we're going to focus on on-chain privacy for the most part, at least for the at least for the near future. I obviously can't speak for everything Mateus does because he's a he's a creative guy and he 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 still surprises me. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll be like, "What you did? What?" And I, I hey. I had no idea he was working on that, and it ends up being great. So I think that uh, we can expect some unexpected things on the off-chain components, and then on-chain. I think I've I, you know I've covered most of what we're uh, you know most of what we're planning to do. So uh, Wasabi Wallet has built a business off of their service and their wallet with BTC on fees. Are there any fees associated with Decred's mixing? Right now, the only fees uh, that exist are are ones for uh, publishing the coin join transaction. So the participants will, you know, contribute a certain amount. Like, like let's say you have you're the guy with fifty, you know, fifty UTXOs you want to consolidate into one into one chunk, or you know, the <laughs> or that you want to or that you want to use to buy a ticket. You're going to pay more for fees than the person who has one or two or three uh, UTXOs. That said. Um, we, there's no plan to make it make this into a business. However, there there has been a, some discussion about fees as a uh, as a means to uh, what you call it as a means to deter spam or denial of service attacks. So so th- in the future, if there are fees for uh, you know for the um, you know to to participate in the in the coin shuffle plus plus process. It's going to be strictly to prevent malicious actors from, you know, from from executing low cost attacks. All right, let's see. Uh, could you imagine a scenario where you would step back as the lead for DCR and retire? I, I see that as totally, totally conceivable. It's a stressful job. I, you know, I do what I do, and something that you may have noticed with, you know, with with my work, and is that I'm working towards effectively automating away a lot of the things I do. And I've, I, you know, we, we we've already done, we've accomplished it with consensus rule changes, we've accomplished it with uh, voting on proposals, and we're just going to keep ticking the boxes off. Then it'll be, you know, we'll accomplish it for making payouts to contractors. We'll accomplish it for the treasury. We'll we'll you know we'll keep running the ball for the exchange process. So. You know, I'm really here because I like to build stuff, and uh, you know, I I'm not I'm unhappy with the status quo. The world around us is flawed, and I feel like there's too many people focusing on rigging a game to their benefit as opposed to reinventing the game so we can all get along better. And you know, th- that role I don't think that that role you know in 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 my context will go away anytime soon. But whether I am the lead for the project. I think that you know I'm actually trying to engineer myself out of that role because in the, in the grand scheme of things we've already got it now the the stakeholders are sovereign and I'm here to you know I'm essentially the captain and if the stakeholders go captain captain like turn the ship this way you know uh, hey I could fight it for a little while but eventually you know the stakeholders will mutiny and knock me off and you know sort of re- and, and, and replace me but my goal is is to before that happens or you know so it doesn't happen to create a system where we can all steer the wheel, you know, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, steer, steer the ship, and and make sure that we arrive at, at where we all collectively want to go. Do you have any long term uh, long term concerns for the project? The only long term concern I have for the project is, is is a concern that I that I think arises in any governance context, and it is self dealing, self dealing, and cronyism and nepotism. Those those kinds of behaviors are that's the kind of behavior that can basically deep six the project. It, for example, you know, if the stakeholders wanted to, we could we could press to vote for you know a hundred percent of we could completely ditch proof of work and move to a completely proof of stake system and you know collect all of the subsidy. I really would not like to see things like that happen. And that's really what I think the biggest pitfall of a system like this is, which is that at a certain point, if people become, you know, if people start to collude and become self-dealing, it is possible to wreck the system and wreck this sort of great incentive system we have going. So that's my biggest concern in terms of, you know, like, man, I hope this doesn't happen as we go forward. I think that a lot of the people who are stakeholders now get it. And, you know, we're at the 50% point in, or very close to it in terms of uh, the total, you know, the total circulation of Decred. So I think that it's unlikely we're going to, uh, at least I hope it's unlikely, that the stakeholders end up being, becoming a bunch of nepotistic, self-dealing, you know, uh, like, uh, like jerks. 
and then just crash the plane into the mountain. It's possible, but I don't think it's probable. Now, what are you most optimistic about when it comes to the project? I'm optimistic about continuing to unrig games. Uh, our society is is underpinned by a whole bunch of games. People don't. People try to you know. People try to dress it up and claim like, oh no, I'm in a suit. This is serious. This isn't a game. Everything's a game. Money, you know, money, getting laid, all of these, you know, all the things that that people think about on exchange, you know, uh, who's allowed to do what, laws, free speech. It's all a game. And uh, the games that exist are just incredibly, I think a lot of them are just incredibly flawed. I'm a huge fan of free speech and I feel, you know, I feel like, the United States is a great place for that. And I think that uh, the unfortunate reality, though, is that that is all kind of going into the toilet. So what I'm optimistic about is I'm optimistic about, you know, the project's ability to reinvent and, and retool games that our society depends on, like the storage and transmission of value, the, the ability to make collective decisions, the ability to, uh, to have permissionless exchange. The, the, you know, the, 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 the games keep going. It's just a question of for, reformulating uh, the world around us in terms of games that are uh, meaningful and can be made fair. And that's what I'm really optimistic about in the context of the project. Let's see. So now let's get into the Decred Bulletproof section. Um, I've gathered some statements from Twitter and different places online, taking a shot at the project. So the first statement or question is, well, this is a question. If Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? I think I've already touched on this, which is uh, the self-dealing and nepotism. If the stakeholders, you know, vote to self-deal and like dial up their subsidy, that's a way to wreck the project. I mean, it's it's pretty obvious to anybody who's you know who takes a, even a, even a passing look at the project who has an eye for cryptocurrencies. Right. Some have, some have stated like uh, the BTC dominance just overtaking all the alts. Like we've gotten different answers when it comes to that. So you think the government? Oh, I mean, that's, I mean, there's a lot of people who think that. I think that people, people's brains want the world to centralize because that's how their brain works. They right. want to project their their inability to focus on multiple things at once onto everything around them. So that's not surprising. Understood. So here's another. Some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. I think there's something to be said for that, but if you look at it, no one else has been willing to do what we've done in the sense that we've gone the furthest of any project out there to cede sovereignty over major decisions, and that includes consensus changes, proposals, funding. We've ceded more sovereignty than any other project out there. You can argue that it's just a specific activation method, but what it really comes down to is a system of governance, and most projects, uh, you know, most projects are unwilling or unable to integrate a system like this. Once you have an existing system and someone's in charge, power corrupts most people. You know, I've, I've been in charge of my own businesses for long enough to know that the crown is heavy. It wears on me. It's like, you know, say this privacy release, it was exhausting. But, you know, I have the wisdom to say, listen, in the, in the grand scheme of things and in the long term, me being in charge, you know, being, being a, a, what is it, benevolent dictator for life, which is a common, you know, governance system for open source software, that just does that is, that is not sustainable. That's crap. Like I, you know, so this idea that it's just an activation method is is garbage. We've so, it, decred represents the gamification of decision making, and that that goes deep enough that hey, look at Ethereum, look at Zcash, um, you know, and look at a lot of other pure proof of work coins. They don't have the uh, they don't have the confidence or the or, you know, or the will to give up the power that they enjoy as, say, the gatekeepers of their systems and you know, cede their sovereignty to stakeholders or whoever holds the coins. So I think it's way more than just an activation method. I think uh, the recent Zcash uh, debacle is a, is a good example about it not being able to be ported in. Well, I think that he, uh, so. I think that there, there, there's a wording, a wording thing. You say it's not able to be ported in. I would say that people aren't willing to port it in, hmm. right? Because 
they're able to do it. You know, the Z, the Zcash, Zcash has a good dev team, and you know, there's several other good te- dev teams out there. Bitcoin has a good dev team. They'd never implement a system like this. And why? Why would they not do that? Because when you're the when you're the guy on the central planning committee, you don't want to give up your sovereignty. You're the you're you're the guy behind the desk who has all the power. You're not going to be like, oh man, I don't want all this power. You and and, and hey, maybe one person might say that, but then the the rest of the people, no, they enjoy that power. They like it. That's why they are where they are doing what they're doing so uh, you know i think that it's it's really a question of will more so than it is of ability and the same thing goes for ethereum right so let's see bitcoin launched without a pre-mine all of the projects outside of bitcoin are built around the financial interests of their creators well bitcoin was launched with a pre-mine but the pre-mine was for people on the uh you know on the cypherpunks mailing list um it's really <laughs> It's just a question of how you want to play the game. And then, I mean, you could argue that uh, the, the, the coins mined by the, the Satoshi group, those are a pre-mine. I mean, in, think about it. There's not many, there's not many projects where, where people wouldn't consider that a pre-mine. It's like, you know, you look at, I mean, say Dash can try to claim they didn't have a pre-mine when they had their quote-unquote insta-mine that was like a whoops accident. Um, it's, all, it's all a question of attention, who's doing what, and... You know, to claim that Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine is a bit ridiculous. I think that I think that people, lots of people, want to claim that Bitcoin is super special. It's got the biggest network. It's got a lot of attention on it. It's got a lot of name brand recognition. Like you can't argue with that. But when it comes to you know, like oh, it was the fairest launch of them all. Come on, like it 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 what? So basically, because I'm because no, you know, a whole bunch of us weren't on the Cypherpunks mailing list. Uh, you know, we're, we're SOL in terms of hearing about the newest, greatest, latest technology. It's like, that's, uh, you know, that's its own pre-mine. Understood. So here's another, uh, people will invest in things that make the world better, whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into the protocol to incentivize development. I am. Oh, and then, oh, uh, I would argue that that is like not just 90% bullshit. That is a thousand percent bullshit. I, <laughs> I spent a couple million dollars building out infrastructure for the Bitcoin network only to learn that basically the, the, you know, the core devs when, and, and people at Blockstream really did not like what I was doing uh, and didn't like what my devs were building. And then you go, well, what's their solution? Their solution is to get a whole bunch of venture capital funding. It's, it, 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 if you think you can run a network without, uh, without funding, you're living on, you're, 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 you're so far gone, it's not even worth arguing with you. So this idea that, oh, it's, the network's going to magically fund itself, doing work for years, years on end that requires a lot of technical knowledge and skill and ability is not something that people do for free. This ha- money for this shit has to come from somewhere. I saw it firsthand. I went minus two million dollars on all of this stuff, and I, I got nothing. I got nothing out of it. You know, directly, I had to basically pivot and you know figure out a way to you know to monetize this process. And in that process, I ended up uh, I ended up finding a way to monetize it not just for myself but for all of us who work on the project. So this idea that you know you can. Uh, that you know, dev fund. That the dev fund is is a bad idea. It's like anyone who says that has never been involved in running a real business or building to something of substance over a long period of time. The only people who will make that argument are people who are you know like uh, you know fanboys who've never really been in the game. Got it. So Jake, I, I appreciate you taking the time out to to come on the show and explaining the latest and greatest with uh, DCR. What are your closing thoughts and a message to newcomers and potential stakeholders? I really appreciate you having me on. And, uh, you know, in terms of stakeholders and users is we're trying to, uh, you know, our goal with Decred is much bigger than just, oh, it's a cryptocurrency. You're going to bet on it. You're going to exit. You're going to make money. That's not, you know, that's uh, sure. Everybody likes to make money. And and in terms of the ultimate goals of the project, we'd, we, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to perform for people who, who choose to bet on us. But what it comes down to is Decred is really about, uh, you know, reorganizing society around fairer games. And I think that, you know, we're executing that vision by increasing your security with our hybrid, uh, with our hybrid consensus system. We're adapting to the changing landscape by, you know, allowing stakeholders to be sovereign and vote on what they do and don't want to happen. And we are uh, making sure it's sustainable by funding that process on an ongoing basis, as opposed to waiting for, you know, vulture capitalists to come and pick the flesh off our corpse. 
And we're here to solve major problems. We're not going to stop with the decks or with decision making or any of that. We're going to keep going, and we're going to, you know, we're going to reorganize society in a way that that, that is fairer and, uh, you know, just less rigged, uh, you know, to, to to beat that term to death. And I, we're always looking for new talent and new people to show up, and you know, who who, who see where we're who see where we're trying to steer things. This isn't, this isn't, uh, you know, everyone and a lot of people in the space use price or, you know, sort of market cap as a metric for relevance. We don't feel that that's that relevant. So even if people might look at the project and say, hey, oh, your market cap's not that big, that's not what it's all about. And, uh, you know, so we're looking for principled people who understand this and want to build something great as a, you know, as a group, as opposed to, uh, you know, create, just, you know, reproduce nation state governance or any of that garbage. Incredible. Thank you, Jacob. Cheers.